congratulations just a, a month or two ago, I guess. And so um, it's just kind of funny. But, uh, Rasmus actually has family in, in the area. And um, in addition to being an expert on resting at MRI, and uh, he's, he's done both human and animal studies. So I think he's going to have a wide range of experience to talk about. He's been also um, interested in sort of artifacts and sort of when things go bad and, and how to figure out what's going on. Um, and uh, he's also a very good cook. So if you can get him to come to your place and cook some food, I think it would be well worth it. So um, that's, that's a strong recommendation for me because his Facebook posts always make me very hungry. So it's really, really good posts. Really, really good food. Um, nice presentation. So without further ado, I'll introduce Rasmus. So today. just I thank him for uh, coming and taking the time. He's actually here visiting his family. And on the side, he agreed to come out and spend time with us and give a talk. So I'm really grateful that, uh, that he was willing to do that. So without further ado, Rasmus. Great, thanks. Thing, but in addition to that, when you're scanning somebody at rest, 
there's all the other mental activity that's going on while they're at rest in the scanner. Uh, I mean, so many times I've read papers or seen studies where the uh, people say that they try to ask the subjects to refrain from any cognitive activity during rest, which you can ask them to do that, but nobody's going to shut down their brain while they're at rest. So there's still going to be all that other mental activity. So there's something to keep in the back of your mind is that when we're looking at resting state studies, it's spontaneous neural fluctuations plus whatever other mental states that are going on inside the group. And with this resting state technique, we can look not just at the motor cortex network that I just showed you here, but we can look at a wide range of networks. And this is actually a really cool study from now a number of years ago, uh, about 2009, from Steve Smith and some of his colleagues, actually a large number of collaborators. And actually what they were showing here is on the left, they did an ICA decomposition of resting state data that they collected. And on the right, they took the data from the brain map database, which is basically a collection of uh, imaging studies. People submit uh, data to them or just locations and activations that they found in imaging studies. And by doing ICA analysis on that, uh, they basically were trying to see are there certain areas that tend to be co-activated in general when looking across all of these different studies that were done. And sure enough, get very similar looking networks out when you're looking at task data uh, from this brain map database or from resting state data. So this is really encouraging. First, it tells us that you know, resting state functional connectivity is real. It's actually telling us functionally relevant networks. And uh, it also shows you that pretty much all the things that we have been able to see with the gamut of functional tasks that we've looked at, at least those that have been submitted to the brain map database, we can also see with resting state data. Now, I wanted to use this as sort of a jumping off point for my talk because when I saw this, I thought this is a really excellent study, really wonderful that we see all these things in resting state data, but it's just the first step, right? Because what, ultimately what we want, uh, this shows that we feel across in 30 individuals, we get very consistent uh, activation maps, we get very consistent functional connectivity maps, but ultimately we're, a lot of times, we're interested not in what individuals have in common, but what is different about certain individuals or, or certain groups of individuals. So we don't want every individual to look exactly the same. We actually want to look at those differences. So that's sort of the next step is how do we look at those differences and what could be the source of those differences. So what I'm showing you here is in just an example from some of my own studies. Looking at, in this case, four subjects. Of course, we scan a lot more subjects than this. Um, and at three different time points. And I can tell you the first two were actually acquired in the same session, about a half an hour apart. And the other one, we brought the individual back about two months later, we scanned them again. And in this particular case, we're looking at the functional connectivity of the amygdala. And you can see, um, generally, overall, what we see is strong connectivity to the contralateral amygdala on the other side. But in addition to that, you see a lot of variability um, within a subject and between subjects. You know, so this particular individual has much stronger connectivity. And for example, here we see that yeah, it's generally consistent, but then we get some other artifacts or maybe some other effects here. And maybe you can imagine that, or you can uh, take an educated guess or try to hypothesize it because we see this weird structure maybe this banding of streaks that maybe doesn't do an artifact. So the question really is, okay, how much of this variability that we're seeing is real, the normal differences, and how much of that is artifact? So let's take a look at the first thing. So in order to look at this, this is the study that we designed. Um, we had in the first session, eyes open, closed, and fixating. Because one of our questions as well was, is there a difference between eyes open, closed, and fixating in terms of not just the, the connectivity maps you get, but also the reliability of the connectivity maps you can get. And then we brought them back two or three months later. We did this uh, again. So we did counterbalance the order across individuals, but we kept the order of, say, open, closed, fixing the same for the first part, the second part, and the third part. So you can also compare that a bit easier. Uh, we scanned, in this case, what I'm going to be presenting is 24 young adults. Uh, we also have data from about 25 older adults as well, so we're looking at some aging effects. So the first question we asked is, does the eyes open or the closed state affect the reliability of this measure? Because uh, ultimately, when we want to get something that's robust on an individual subject basis, that's really what we need. We need a very robust, reliable measure. And uh, well, when you do the statistical tests, you do find out that the eyes open and fixating condition does tend to be the most reliable of the three. Now, I should say this is averaged across all uh, significant connections that we saw. Um, you know, there's quite a bit of variability between connections, and no, 
notably, uh, the uh, visual cortex actually uh, was most reliable for the eyes open and not to fixate condition. Uh, and that maybe is because you actually have the person moving around, so you get a lot more modulation within the visual cortex from that. Um, but the other thing you notice is that the differences in the reliability as measured by the class correlation coefficient here are pretty small. So yes, eyes open fixate is generally the most reliable, but we're talking differences of like, you know, going from 0.6 to 0.65 test for this reliability. Uh, the other one that's a little bit disconcerting to us is that the intercession reliability, bringing something back to three months later, dropped about 0.3. So not that great. So that's one of the current things I'm working on right now is how can we improve that? Is there a way we can try to improve that test for just reliability, particularly from session to session? And I must say that you know this is the result we've gotten from our own studies. It is generally consistent with what I've seen from uh, some other studies I've like done earlier work in Shazad, looking at test for reliability. But I did look at uh, rather across some more recent studies uh, where they're looking at test retest reliability and did find much higher reliability across sessions, although it was a lot more limited number of subjects, so it's a bit hard to draw conclusions from that. But so maybe part of it may be the, the exact way we're uh, doing the connectivity or you know, exact parameters. And that's in a way what I'm trying to look at is what could be modulating the reliability. So the other thing we looked at with this. Uh, is what about scan duration? And this is some earlier work from Conan uh, Van Dyke, uh, where in the top graph it's showing you the functional connectivity for increasing duration of the scans for areas that are supposed to be connected. And I believe this is uh, either the motor cortex and visual cortex, and then there's some uh, reference network as well, areas that are not really supposed to be connected but are functional. Uh, in the bottom, you're seeing a connection between functional areas and areas that are not expected to be connected, like the white matter. Uh, this area is shown here in maybe CSF next to too. And what this shows is that generally this measure plateaus at around five to seven minutes. At about five to seven minutes, you start getting the measure that tends to be pretty stable. But what this is looking at is this is looking at at what how much data do you need to get something that say looks like the default mode network or looks like a motor network as opposed to having a lot of other junk in areas that are not supposed to be connected. It's not really telling you how reliable is the measure of strength of connectivity, you know, the actual you know, strength of connectivity from one session to the next. Uh, it's really just saying, is it connected or not? So if we look at that, uh, and we actually looked at that with our data that we had, and in, in this particular case, we combine the eyes open, closed, and fixate conditions in equal amounts uh, so that we have as much data as possible. And what you find is that actually the more data you acquire, the reliability does keep increasing quite a bit. Uh, so the usual five to seven minutes, yeah, you do pretty good, but you can get quite a bit better reliability when you get, say, half an hour's worth of scanning. Uh, we find that the elbow of this curve is somewhere around 12 to 15 minutes. Uh, so generally, I try to balance this with the practicalities of doing an MRI experiment where we want to cram a lot of things into it, including task data, diffusion imaging, and so on. So, I still try to stick now with at least 10 minutes of resting state data from this. Um, again, intercession reliability does improve, but it's still it's not nearly as high as we'd like it to be. Um, you know, I've got a couple of ideas for that, but I'm also love to hear your thoughts on what might be going on with this here. Um, so the first question might be, uh, could this be because of artifact? Could there be noise here that's causing reliability? Uh, and this makes sense because in addition to spontaneous neural activity that's causing these differences in the signal, we've got a lot of other sources of noise. Physiological noise, like respiration and heartbeat, subject motion, scanner instabilities, and reconstruction errors, and hopefully the physicist is taking care of most of this, that the scanner is nice and stable. So we're going to spend most of the time looking at these effects right here. So heartbeat, uh, this is just where you're going to see most of the changes. Uh, I mean, people have known this for a long time since the beginning of fMRI. Um, the more problematic uh, ones, uh, and in, in addition, you've got breathing-related changes that didn't have a slide on there for that. Uh, and we've got ways to filter that out using retroact or, for example, some techniques. For a more tricky part uh, is this here. Uh, this is actually some data from an earlier study from Richard Wise, where he looked at uh, changes in end tidal CO2 I'm going to fix that one of these days. It's always a little bit slice of advanced or something like that. But <laughs> what they looked at in this one is really interesting is they averaged the um, gray matter signal and, and white matter signal. Uh, you can see that right here. 
But then they also looked at the end tidal CO2 just during rest. Uh, and you can see a striking correlation here between the average gray matter signal and white matter signal and this changes in end tidal CO2. And if you actually correlate changes in end tidal CO2, so I can't do it for some hemodynamic delay, with the brain, you see you know, actually a fairly you know, good structure here, generally throughout gray matter, with some hot spots in certain places as well. Uh, these are areas that are showing sort of modulation with variations in end tidal CO2. And the reason for that is that carbon dioxide is a very important vasodilator. So if you hold your breath, carbon dioxide builds up in your blood, causes the blood vessels in your brain to dilate, and you're going to see a nice blood flow map, just like a breath holding study, blood flow map of going hold the signal, basically, up signal increasing everywhere in the brain. Uh, and that happens not just when you're doing a breath hold, but even just naturally at rest, your breathing varies, and you see huge changes uh, throughout the brain from that. And we looked at that as well. Um, that, yeah, I don't have a slide on that. I mean, I've given tons of talks on that, but this is a uh, problematic. You can look at this, you can see this, even if you just look at the envelope of some of this breathing trace, uh, and then you look for where they have patterns, you get a very similar looking after this. Now, we've come up with correction methods to try to correct for these. Uh, here I just list uh, a few of the different correction methods that have been developed over the years. Um, I think all these slides are going to be available later, so down these articles if you're really interested in, um, you know, some of these like the retro i core use information about the actual uh, measurements of the heartbeat and respiration to try to filter that out, um, or they use ICA-based approaches, and of course, you have uh, respiration volume of time, or the heart rate corrections. Um, you can address up gray matter and white matter, and that's also some uh, correction that works pretty well. Uh, I love some of these acronyms, like the Apple core and the Care core. Is actually the parallel execution of alpha core and retro i core uh, developed as lead by you know, collaboration with uh, Lady Chang and some of the other people there. Um, I've often wanted to come up with or have somebody come up with an orange core and then have them comparing apples and oranges. I'd <laughs> probably get criticized for that. So, um, there's some really nice new techniques like to fix the fMRI B's ICA based X noise with fire, another really fun acronym there. Um, I also list that this, the reason I bring all this up here is because it illustrates another challenge that we're facing, is that there are so many correction techniques out there, it's really hard to know which one to apply. And if you read their papers, each one of them claims to be the best, um, that this is really the technique you should use. Um, probably it's been evolving throughout time, so even the more later ones are currently the more accepted ones. But it's still something we're looking at and trying to figure out, okay, which one of these should we be doing? So, and Similarly, in terms of different correction methods, here's, again, I'm not expecting you to actually read through all this. The point of this is to illustrate that there's a lot of steps involved in pre-processing our data before we will finally collect our functional connectivity analyses. And so what order should these steps be done in? Um, you know, should they be done at all? Or what algorithm are you going to use in each of these different steps? Those are going to have some impacts on the functional connectivity results. Uh, and that's something that I'm also very interested in, is looking at okay, how is that going to impact reliability or, or the actual effects that we're going to get. So we looked at that in this particular study, and I set out to look at, okay, what is the initial way we designed the study was so, you know, okay, we do test read this data, we collect all this information, let's apply all these different correction methods and see which one gives us the most reliable data. Makes sense. And here's what the connectivity map looks like. We see the, uh, the posterior cingulate region, um, and this right here, we're just supposed to reproduce a nice default mode network uh, structure and um, calculate the functional connectivity from that. And here I'm thresholding all of these at a fairly high, uh, I think it's 10 to minus 10 individual box spaces. Uh, and here's the connectivity map here. Know, so this is without any corrections with the retro core. We're removing respiration volume for time changes, we the respiration volume for heart rate changes, regressing on white matter and CSF changes, or maybe those with, with global signal as well. And you can see here, uh, obviously you see the most stri uh, striking effect of white matter CSF CSM, global signal regression, where you do get something that looks like the default mode network that we expect. But if we raise the threshold on these uh, a little bit, we actually find the same kind of network coming out uh, with all of these different correction methods. Um, you know, there are some subtle differences between if you look at the front and low between if you do and if you don't do white matter CSF CSM regression uh, from this. Okay, so the first thing you might ask is, well, does this have any impact at all? 
uh, on the functional connectivity. It looks like it's really not changing anything. What this is um, now actually doing a t test on the connectivity maps relative to no correction whatsoever. So the retro eye core actually in this case has very little effect. And perhaps that's because the voice you're seeing really isn't affected very much by pulse of how uh, blood flow and mechanical respiration movement. We do see some improvements throughout the brain, not a huge amount. Uh, RBT core does correct for a lot of the variability. Uh, so even though it doesn't seem to make much of a difference in the kind of view map, we, there are actually changes to, throughout the brain matter. Our PHR cords are something we as well. Our MNHA sat and global, all of these are accounting for substantial amounts of noise. Uh, the other thing we could look at is not just how much they affect the connectivity map, in this case from a posterior singularity, but also where are they accounting for variance. Uh, so this again is versus doing no correction on whatsoever. The red Y core, the RBT core, and the correction that I described before. What's interesting to note here is these techniques, and I should clarify that the respiration block corrections here and the, with the heart rate corrections here do incorporate the right y core as well. But you can see that they explain a lot of variance right in the pulse of the right around the circle of Willis, um, a lot of these blood vessels that we see around. Whereas the white matter and the CSF regressions um, account for significantly more variance throughout gray matter if you were to average across that. But they also account for a lot less variance uh, within uh, the pulse tile vessels within circle of Willis. So what this is saying to me is that you know, we do account for a lot more variance uh, in general across gray matter uh, with doing the white matter CSF regressions or averaging the white matter CSF signals through moving that can account for a lot of the physiological variations. But it doesn't do a very good job of cleaning up some of the pulse tile blood flow that we see and what we can get out when we do the red white core kinds of regressions. So typically when I have the data available, I still do both red white core and these other kinds of correction methods. Um, but I know sometimes it's difficult to collect the cardiac data, um, some of the freely available data that's really valuable out there has been collected the physiological data. So my view is I still analyze it without the physiological noise correction. You know, we do the best we can. Um, in general, it doesn't make a huge difference in the functional connectivity maps, what I've seen, unless maybe you have C regions right close to some of these multi tile blood vessels. But as you saw from the previous one, the posterior singularity just in the retroactive work didn't have a huge amount of difference. So I'm not too worried about it. So what about reliability? Well, here's where we are going for a bit of a loop. Um, so on the left is the interclass correlation coefficient, the test for test reliability when we don't do any of these corrections. And here's what happens when we start doing these various corrections. And the asterisks are ones where we actually see a significant change in the reliability. And what was surprising to us uh, is that the reliability, no matter what we did to the signal, went down. And uh, now looking at this a bit further, the ICC is a comparison between within subject variability to between subject variability. The idea is you want to have, or vice versa, so you want to have large differences between individuals relative to the differences you might see within an individual across the sections. And if we look at those separately, what you find is that, and again I'm showing you here in green, the lower bars, the within subject variability, and in red, or the uh, bars right above that, the between subject variability. And the within subject variance is going down when we're applying these correction methods. But the more striking difference is that the between subject variance is decreasing quite substantially. And so as a result, when we take the ratio of these, you know, the reliability as measured by the interclass correlation coefficient seems to decrease from this. Uh, so this is sort of where we're stuck. This is how we've published this now. Um, there's a couple different takes on this. Um, one is, well, maybe we shouldn't be doing these kinds of corrections because they're hurting our reliability. On the other hand, we do know that they cause a lot of variance that is not related to neural function, not the fluctuations like head motion causes huge amounts of variance throughout the brain. And I do think we should correct for those kinds of fluctuations. So, in a way, maybe doing these corrections is making our estimates more valid, more close to the actual truth, but in a strict speaking term, reducing the test for test reliability. The other caveat I should bring up at this point is we're looking here at a group of individuals, 24 individuals that are all healthy young adults. And what we're seeing here is that as we apply these different correction methods, the variance is decreasing and the estimates of the connectivity are sort of narrowing, becoming sharper. But that's making it more difficult to distinguish the functional connectivity within this group. But maybe there isn't much variance here to begin with. Maybe if we took a population with say, schizophrenia or with autism, maybe we start to see some interesting differences. So, you know, that's something I'd love to work towards. Again, here it starts to become a bit problematic because let's say you take an individual group with autism, um, 
and you decide to do all of this kind of uh, laborious work and see what processing techniques help, you might come to the conclusion that not doing motion correction really helps you because all of these subjects of autism tend to move more, and keeping the motion in them really helps you distinguish those groups from the main group of individuals with autism. But we know that that's not the right <coughs> way back to the neural function, so it's still a bit tricky to try to tease that part. That's where I'd love to be. have some of your thoughts on how to tease that part. Where I'm thinking it would probably go is to correct the techniques that we know are causing variance in there, and perhaps moving to a more multimodal approach. So I think it's EEG and I'm going to start answering some of these questions as well. We're also looking at the, you know, the spatial signatures. And ICA is another approach that might actually get around a lot of the sources. So uh, a lot of my approach has been now trying to see what we can do to improve these techniques. Uh, one thing we know, for example, is that the respiration response function of the RIR, as I'll show you, varies quite a bit across the brain. Uh, so uh, when I'm showing you this color plot here, uh, the relative latencies of the typical respiration response. So if you take this and you convolve it with the envelope of the breathing trace, so changes the breathing volume, uh, you would find that it actually fits the data relatively well but the latency at which it fits varies quite a bit. And you actually have to shift things back by several seconds to get the benefit. And actually, if you uh, calculate that you're allowing for that shift, uh, so if you don't allow for that shift, you kind of think about variance point away, you have 8% variance. If you do allow for that shift, you acquire, uh, you kind of conserve like more variance for that. Um, similarly, uh, this is uh, thinking we have to also try to find out the same idea here, but Instead of using the external measurement of the breathing, we're just taking the average uh, white matter signal. And very similar to PST or from Jeff Anderson, where he shifted that average signal to get a better fit with the gray matter, because the vasculature of the gray matter uh, has a slightly different delay than the white matter. Uh, when we do this, we do this on a voxelwise basis and find the best shift. You can see here's a histogram of the different latencies, and there's a bit of a difference between gray matter and white matter. Uh, this is sort of showing that in a spatial manner. Uh, it actually varies quite a bit about space. So if we allow that to shift, we can account for significantly more variance. Um, and I call this sort of the white matter shift in physiological regression or whisper because it reduces the noise. It's kind of a fun thing to do. The other bigger problem uh, we're trying to tackle is head motion. And this is something that's really come out, particularly in the last three, four years. Uh, we've, we've always known that head motion is a problem. But there's a couple of studies that came out in 2012 that really opened people's eyes. Uh, this, particularly in the context of functional connectivity. Uh, the first one was from uh, Conan Van Dyke, uh, and then one shortly after that from Jonathan Tower. And there's a couple of reasons why this caught people's eyes. Uh, so what shown here is the temporal signals noise for mean amount of motion. And okay, not surprisingly, if you move, if you have more motion, the signal to noise goes down. Okay, but look at the axis here, the scale. This is 0 0.02 millimeters of motion. And granted, this is on average across the entire run, but still, we're talking movements of less than a millimeter from frame to frame and cause these kinds of problems. And the same thing was seen by uh, Jonathan Power. And they also noticed another disturbing effect, and that is if you take out, if you censor out all the time points that might be corrupted with motion and compare the resulting connectivity maps, you find out that the ones at short distances were decreased, and the ones at long distances were increased. That is to say, the effect of the motion was to increase short-range connectivity and decrease long-range connectivity. Uh, because taking it out had the opposite effect. The reason why this disturbed people so much is that the exact, this is the exact same thing that, that people saw during brain development. Brain development, one of the nice findings was that uh, generally when we compare kids to adults, kids have more short-range connectivity and lower long-range connectivity, and this sort of made it suddenly appear like, well, could this be just because kids move more in the scan? Uh, now, I did talk with some of the authors of these studies afterwards, of the developmental studies, and I know like Damien Fair, for example, went back and reanalyzed a lot of this data with the proper sensoring, and still, the same effects still hold, maybe not in all the same brain regions, it gets a bit more complex, but generally that pattern of increasing long range connection still holds. Um, when I was talking with the WashU folks, they had a slightly different opinion, and they thought you know, most of this was still an artifact, so still a bit of disagreement on that point, but certainly an agreement that emotion is a lot here. So how can we correct for that? Well, the traditional methods that have been done is to regress out the motion parameters, uh, maybe sensor time points. Uh, I should mention that these graphs and these analyses were done with registering images with regressing out the motion parameters. 
So it's really only when they did the very stringent censoring and throwing out the corrupted time points that they got something that they won't have to believe in. The problem with that is that you end up throwing out a lot of your data, sometimes half or even more of your data. And it can have some potentially deleterious effects. You're messing with the temporal autocorrelations within the data. You're changing the temporal frequency structure. And how you combine this with temporal filtering is a bit trickier, and so on. Uh, so there's a couple of techniques that I've looked into to try to improve this. Uh, the first actually comes out of some of the work that I did for my PhD thesis, which was looking at uh, task-related movements. Uh, and if you actually look at motion, you find a lot of the movement happens, a lot of the signal changes happen at the edges of the brain, because that's where most of the signal change happens. So if we take all of the edges, and defined in this case on our single plane range volumes, and um, well, we've got a lot of time courses here, we can do the principal components decomposition to try to find the main uh, temporal signatures of those. And if we take those into a regression analysis, we find, sure enough, it's the edge voxels as opposed to the six motion parameters plus or first derivatives, we can bring significantly more variance within on um, average across the whole brain. Uh, we looked at various iterations of this, so sort of first, easier. Uh, we looked at, um, again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of this, but you know, regressing on, say, the motion parameters first, and then doing this edge voxel detection, and that seems to help a little bit better. Uh, also comparing it to 24 uh, motion regressors that was uh, suggested by Kristen and all and so on. So we still did uh, quite well in terms of the amount of variance we explained with this. The other approach was, instead of taking the uh, motion parameters themselves, uh, that's assuming that the motion estimate that you have is linearly related to the actual signal changes. But that's not necessarily the case. So if you imagine having a curved edge, if you move in one direction, you might see the signal decrease Side of sort of outside. And if you move in the other direction, the signal doesn't necessarily increase by the same amount. So it's not really a linear problem. But if instead, let's say, take a single EPI volume that you've collected and then move it according to the estimated motion, you get a simulated data set of basically all the motion in your signal changes. Then you can do an IC or principal components decomposition on all those time series and fit those to the data. So that's what I'm showing here on the left of the typical all motion regressors that we've used. On the right are the more simulated motion regressors actually estimating what the signal change is that is induced by that motion <coughs> rather than just the motion itself. You can see that it fits quite a bit better. Uh, this is sort of where it fits the best. It not be surprising you might be low because most of the motion is head nodding, that's where you can see the biggest uh, signal changes. Uh, so we'll still try to find that out, get that out of it now. So the other acquisition, and I uh, wish the last time possible was here, I'd love to talk with him a bit more about this, but we've been looking a lot more at really pushing the temporal resolution um, to and, and come up with new imaging strategies to try to reduce some of the motion effects. Uh, so this is a collaboration I've been doing with Andrew Nenka at the Medical College of Wisconsin, um, and uh, looking at, first of all, improving the acquisition speed, but also um, tweaking the uh, acquisition, because I'm now using those simultaneous multi slides from multi-band acquisitions. Uh, but one of the challenges there is if you were just to by the typical SMS image and the person moves quite a bit, uh, you no longer have the right sensitivity profile information of how these coils um, map onto the brain. Uh, so for this sequence, we actually uh, acquired the calibration data throughout the entire acquisition. And so we can use dynamic uh, calibration for uh, information to try to correct that. We actually get really nice data from very large amounts of data. So the other part of the talk, uh, the last about 15 minutes or so, I just wanted to end it on a more positive note or start looking at um, some of the other reasons why maybe there's variability from session to session. And that is, is there actually a difference in the function, in the functional organization that we see from session to session or from moment to moment to moment? Uh, and you know, this is perhaps not too surprising because if you bring something back two or three months later, they may be thinking about something else in the scanner. Um, and the, the other thing I would think of is that maybe um, going back to that study that I showed you which looked at the test frequency reliability and sort of more flat running as you get to 15, 20, 30 minutes of data. Maybe it's because we actually are looking at real neural effects, but if you only have a five minute snapshot of somebody's brain, if you look at the dynamics of that, it might look completely different or quite different half an hour later or two or three months later. Whereas if you map it over half an hour, maybe that gives you more stable trait like characteristic of that individual. Very much like if you had a conversation with somebody only for five minutes, you get some impression of them. If you had a conversation with them for over half an hour or an hour, you get a much better trade like estimate of that person. So these are two studies now where we're actually trying to look at some of these trade like characteristics 
Uh, the first one is uh, looking at the functional connectivity of emotion networks in humans and taking sort of a developmental perspective. Um, that the reason we're looking into this is that adult depression and anxiety very commonly start in childhood and adolescence. And in fact, early life stress, like not treatment and neglect, significantly increase the risk of labor psychopathology. Uh, so this is um, from a large study of human development in Wisconsin Science of Families of Work. Uh, this is really a neat data set that I was fortunate to work with that was really pioneered by Marilyn Essex, uh, shown in the little right. When they, about 20 years ago, recruited about over 500 mothers, and they followed these kids their entire lives. And you can see all the different time points where we have behavioral assessments, uh, physiology information, and at two time points, we have structural information, um, fMRI, structural and functional information as well. And in the last time point, at uh, age 18, uh, we also collected resting state data. And from earlier studies from Maryland Essex, they found that this early measure of cortisol predicted the individual's uh, anxious uh, behaviors during school age. Uh, and it was like a predictor that, so that's what we said, well maybe what we wanted to take a look at was this age four and a half cortisol. So cortisol measured, cortisol measured, it was actually over a period of three days average together. Uh, when the kids are about four years old, and does it correlate at all with what their brain looks like at age 18? So pretty standard imaging parameters you see here. This is what the amygdala connectivity looks like. We're particularly interested in the amygdala connectivity because it's involved in emotional regulation and all these functions related very much to anxiety. And uh, this is what we find when we correlate uh, the functional connectivity to that early cortisol measure. So quite a significant correlation. And this is the area. The connectivity between the amygdala and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex uh, that's correlated with the cortisol measure. Um, the other interesting effect we found here was that in the reddish color, I indicate the females in the group and the blue the males, and this entire effect seemed to be driven by the females in the group. Now we know that females have a much higher rate of incidence of depression and anxiety, so perhaps this is a potential manifestation of that. Um, you know, looking at perhaps different mechanisms for what could be causing uh, that anxiety uh, in these individuals. Um, it's really surprising to see this. Um, I should also mention that you know, it looks like there's a couple outliers here. We did remove those in one of our tests to see does this effect still hold, and yes, we still get this effect when we remove those outliers. I didn't remove it in this case because um, there was nothing on the imaging maps when I looked them that indicated this should be an artifact or error. It didn't look like any artifact spatially. Um, also, when you look at the entire population of the 560 individuals that had cortisol measurements, these were not actually outliers on that larger group in terms of just in the subset that we look at for the imagery. Nevertheless, it still survives when we take those out. Uh, we also looked at sort of a structural equation modeling from this. We found that this measure of childhood cortisol mediated the relationship between early maternal stress, and this is um, early maternal depression, or overload of stress in others during the parenting. It mediated the relationship between that stress and the changes we saw in the make up prefrontal connectivity, and we also saw the relationship Cortisol, uh, sorry, between this amygdala connectivity and current anxious symptoms as well. Sort of forming a nice diagram. It's really surprising that we should see it affects 14 years later in the brain from some of these earlier measures. Um, and this is the, the you know, correlation between that functional connectivity and the adolescent anxious symptoms, which is a pretty robust functional, uh, correlation that we see here. We did a follow up study on this as well, looking not just at anxious symptoms and cortisol, but also looking at uh, measures of um, self-reported childhood maltreatments from the Childhood Trauma Questionnaire. And in this case, uh, we found that we actually looked at not just the amygdala, but also the hippocampus. Uh, and as I mentioned, the hippocampus didn't come up in the previous analysis. What we did find here is, again, this connectivity between both the amygdala and the hippocampus and this region of the subgenital cingulate, so a little bit different area than we saw before, but in the same general region of the BMPRC, again, negative relationship. And interestingly enough, here we see, again, amygdala to this VMPFC region, only in the females, not the males, but the hippocampus we saw both in the males and the females. So potentially this is an explanation for why we see a bigger incidence of anxiety uh, symptoms and anxiety disorders in females is because they, and this is speculation of course, that they could take a hit in both of these networks, whereas the males only seem to see disruption in one of these networks. Uh, so this disruption. Similar areas, but not exactly 
So in summary, this one is the individual differences in resting connectivity are related to individual differences in physiology. So we do see interesting, meaningful differences here, not just artifacts. Um, and early life stress and early parts of cortisol could have long lasting effects on the brain. It uh, can be detected in adolescent resting state connectivity, which is important for emotional regulation, and reducing the disturbance related to anxiety symptoms. So the final study I want to talk about is a really interesting one that uh, I got involved in in collaboration with Ted Kalin, and that is looking at non-human primates. And the reason you might ask why would we need to look at non-human primates? And it turns out that non-human primates can be a very good model for anxiety disorders in children and adults as well. Uh, if you look at their behaviors uh, in responding to stressors, they have very similar types of behaviors. We see increased freezing behaviors in response to stress, decreased spontaneous vocalizations, Levels of cortisol, increased amygdala metabolism, with response sensitivity, um, uh, examined in different ways. So, this was a long ongoing study uh, that, that they had going on in the Kalin's lab. And in this particular case, they also had uh, pet imaging data. So, uh, they injected the FPG pet, they had exposed the uh, animal, the non human primate, to a, this was uh, rhesus macaque monkeys, to a mildly stressful situation. So, basically, the human. Uh, would enter into the room but not look at the monkey. So present the profile to the monkey, and the monkey or some of the monkeys would get very anxious about this because it's sort of uncertain. Did the intruder see me? Did they not? It's an uncertain situation. Very much like what the animal might encounter in the wild when there's sort of an unknown predator or, or sort of an unknown individual in the room and they have to sort of engage. And there's quite a difference in range of behaviors that these monkeys exhibit. Uh, and that can be categorized by increased freezing, changing cooing behavior, and changes in so they got a measure of the anxious temperament from these behaviors. And you know, after this um, no eye contact condition, they anesthetized the monkey and then scanned him in a PET scanner and found areas. Uh, areas uh, that what they looked at was areas that were then correlated with the increase in metabolism. I'll show you that in the next slide. Uh, the uniqueness about this study is that they've looked at a large number of non human primates in this. Uh, so the, the study that I looked at and analyzed, we had uh, successful good MRI data from about 339 macaque monkeys. Uh, to date, they've scanned over about 600 recent macaques now. Uh, I think they're going closer to about 1,000. Uh, FDG had all of these MRI on most of these, and all of these. Uh, again, fairly standard imaging parameters for that. Uh, so this was at the for the first 270 individuals that they scanned. They found that this region uh, Second, which is the amygdala, the metabolism within this region of the amygdala predicted uh, the anxious temperament. So there's a nice correlation between the metabolism of the amygdala and the anxious temperament here. So what we wanted to do was look at the connectivity of that region of the amygdala and see how it varies. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through this pretty uh, processing steps. We had to do quite a bit more tweaks on the alignment. Um, very uh, laborious um, manual segmentation and skull stripping by uh, Maria Jessen, who would hand um, skull strip all 600 of these monkey rings. Um, that's why I just have to show a picture over here. Um, that's basically what she's been doing for the last several years, just you know, tracing my brain. <laughs> so, and the other the point that I want to make is they actually found when they looked at this throughout the time that she got better and better as time progressed. So, when she finished with the 600 subject, they had to start over at the beginning again. So that they would all be consistent. Of course, she got much faster by that time, so it moved much more. It's still hundreds of hours of work. Um, so we see functional connectivity networks uh, very similar to uh, what was from Schroeder and uh, Justin Benson. Uh, in this case, now 339 uh, subjects. And this is now the connectivity within the amygdala. Uh, you know, very strong correlation with the contralateral amygdala. Nice connectivity with the bad nucleus of the sphere of terminalis, which is generally forming sort of like functional unit with the amygdala. Uh, and then we wanted to look at, okay, how does this vary with the measure of anxious temperament? And also, first of all, with the measure of um, the FDG pet. So, uh, this is just measuring that. This is getting the point of the BNST in functional unit. We actually did the same thing with human. We sort of imagine um, having human and monkey show the same thing. Uh, and then, looking at correlating the fMRI functional connectivity results with the metabolism. So the question is, does the connectivity between somewhere and the amygdala predict the amygdala metabolism? And sure enough, what we found is that the region of the uh, DLPFC, the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, and the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, 
to this region of the central interest of amygdala um, was predicting the metabolism of the that region of the amygdala uh, during the uh, PET scan. So the idea is this is a network that's involved in emotion regulation and regulating the activity of the amygdala. So in those uh, individuals that had a stronger functional connectivity between the PFC and the amygdala, we saw lower metabolism, maybe effective regulation, down regulating of the activity within the amygdala. And if we look at anxious temperament, we find actually it's a dorsolateral prefrontal cortex to this region of the central nucleus of the amygdala that we see a nice strong correlation uh, between connectivity and anxious so, and you know, can construct models very similar to that, and again, we find that this uh, measure of metabolism sort of partially mediates the relationship between connectivity and the anxious temperament we saw here. Um, and the other really interesting part is uh, looking at now a separate group of individuals, these are now young humans with anxiety disorders, um, pre adolescents with anxiety disorders, looking at the differences relative to healthy individuals, uh, non controls, it's the same, the connectivity of the same region of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex to the central nucleus of the amygdala, where we see that um, change, where we see that individual difference. So from this study, really, the amygdala metabolism is correlated with anxious temperament. We see that connectivity is negatively correlated with the metabolism and with this anxious temperament. So it's consistent with this model of higher anxious temperament being associated with decreased regulation of the amygdala by the prefrontal cortex. The other main conclusions with this really is that I tried to show you examples not just at areas of where the rest of the functional connectivity is affected by sources of noise, and we have to try to correct for those, but some really nice examples where we do see uh, very robust correlations with individual differences in behavior. Um, in this case, looking at cortisol measures or looking at the anxious temperament within the non human primates. So I'm very hopeful that this technique of resting state functional connectivity can really bring us far, and even though we're still starting with some of the issues of reliability. I think we have enough reliability to start making some interesting differences now. Uh, so with that, I just want to acknowledge all the individuals that have helped um, with some of the slides with the research that I've presented and of course the funding sources with this. Thank you for the invitation and for your attention. Sometimes get quite different results when 
when in fact the head's not moving. Mm -hmm. And so the um, mutual information uses all of the information, or the majority of the information in the image, and only then estimates it if it sees you know, the, the whole image or the whole, um, you know, it's not slice by slice, so it's the whole brain moving. And we found that it's, it, that's, it really improves our ability to what we think estimate, what we think is true motion. Um, and so I was wondering if you played with different motion estimation algorithms in trying to determine um, what's best for estimating motion and or the different artifacts that you're referring to. Yeah, I, I haven't looked at different motion uh, you know, estimation algorithms. I mean, that certainly makes sense that it would be interesting to look at. Well, one of the things, one of the reasons why I got my attention early on is because the the estimation of motion, especially in resting state for a unit correlator, regressive, regressive motion estimator, bold signal, real bold signal, can be estimated as motion in tasks where it's dark and you get a bright, like big motor cortex. The difference in the sum of the squares, the sum of the squares of the differences, right, will show up as motion. When in fact, then when you regress it, all you're doing is removing the signal from voxels in which you really wanted to get the signal in. And in other voxels, you make them look smaller, and in some voxels, you make it negative. And so I think one of the issues with SPM's realignment, other typical realignment algorithms like that, is that they are, they are inducing differences that we don't want to estimate, or in, you know, the algorithms are estimating something as motion when it's not motion. Of course, then if you regress out those signal changes after the fact, maybe you have to correct for some of it. No, I think that I, I think they estimate motion well. But my concern is that they're estimating other things with motion. This was a study that was published by the French group um, that, that we've been found really interesting. It's just that you can eliminate your some of your bold signal if you estimate it as motion and covariate, of course. Mm -hmm. But you can induce false deactivations as well. Right. I'll send you a paper. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. It's yeah. something that I it's always on the top of my mind, and that's why actually why I, I don't typically do the physiological or Regressions like RBT and HR heart rate, because particularly heart rate, um, you know, the physicists tend to think of it as a source of noise, and my psychiatry or psychology colleagues think of it as a source of signal, the yeah. heart rate variability. And in fact, uh, we did a study where I actually looked at the uh, respiration volume changes during the task. Um, and to, you know, initially I was thinking that those individuals that have very strong task correlated breathing would have a lot of artifact, but it turned out to be the opposite effect. Those actually, those individuals had the nicest looking. Uh, so I think what was going on is, if you look at the other individuals, it's not that the breathing was perfectly constant. They were burning all over the place, which is probably because they're bored, they're falling asleep, they're taking deep sighs. And as those individuals are really focused on the task, but they're breathing modulated with the task. Sure. Uh, and so moving that could potentially move the constant signals of interest. Okay. Uh, so that's why I'd much rather try to take nuisance signals from areas that we don't expect to see bold signals from, yeah. like white matter. But again, it's possible effects. Yeah. Alright, so let's go. Let's give them one round of applause.